So, post games. Most games don't tend to actually end when the credits roll. Many go on for a few extra hours afterwards. Some games will even have a second credits roll. How nice! I actually want to make a video going further in depth about this topic, but for now, let's shift the focus to Pokémon. Now, Pokémon and post games go hand in hand. Not all of them are at the same level, the quality is honestly really inconsistent, but generally there will be at least one thing you can do after beating the game. Generation 1, there wasn't really much to talk about. Uh, Mewtwo, I guess? Cool! Pokémon Gold, Silver, and Crystal is where the ball gets rolling, and goddamn didn't Game Freak go all out here. Gen 2 was considered to be the last games at some point, so the effort kinda makes sense. You beat the game, you think you're all done, but no, you have a second region left to explore. It turns out you're only halfway done! Well, that's how it feels anyway, I'll get into it later. Sometimes I feel the Johto games are overshadowed by their post-games. It seems to be the thing people focus on most. Oh yeah, Harkle and SoulSilver are amazing because you can visit Kanto, and there are following Pokémon, and Nostalgia, also Kanto, and it's slow as balls, and you get the idea. I liked Pokémon Crystal, even disregarding the post-game. I think it's an improvement over Gen 1 in almost every way, and I'd recommend it to anyone who likes playing Game Boy games in 2022. I'm effectively reviewing this next part of the game separated from the main campaign. Think of it like a smaller game inside another game. So, how well does it stand? Is Crystal's post-game actually good? Let's find out, shall we? We start our journey back home. You get a call from Professor Elm, and shortly after, you get a ticket to Kanto. I lost the footage for this part, so uh, just pretend I did it. To travel to Kanto, we first have to fly to Olivine City and take the SS Aqua. Well, this seems familiar. You can explore the cabin and fight some trainers, but to progress the story, you have to find this guy's daughter on the ship. I participated in a few fights here, and immediately noticed, hmm, the trainers' levels here are around the mid-30s, while my team is ranging around the mid-40s to early 50s. I sure hope that isn't a bad sign. Eventually, the ship stops and we arrive at Vermilion City. Well, here we are. I would say it's nostalgic standing here, but I literally played Pokemon Red like 8 months ago, so I don't know. Still, it is cool to see this place again, and we already have a few differences. For one, Snorlax got fatter. So here's one of the cooler parts of the post-game. It is completely open. Usually in Pokemon games, you have a set path to follow. You need to tackle gems in a certain order, and you need to go to certain areas to progress the plot. The first couple of games in this series were a lot more open, however, and I think Kanto perfectly exemplifies that. You can do quite a few things as soon as you enter, but you can do it at your own pace. You can tackle all the gems in whatever order, or you can explore the region instead. As for me, well, I decided to just go ahead and start picking off gym leaders, beginning with Vermilion City here. If you remember, Vermilion has Lieutenant Surge, featuring the best gym gimmick ever conceived sarcasm. The thing is, though, there isn't a barrier. You can just ignore the trainers and head to Surge immediately, so that's what I did. If you're wondering, I am continuing the Nuzlocke from the previous video, so if anyone dies, that's it, they're dead. Here's what my team currently looks like, in case you forgot. Luckily, Surge was not really a threat. His Pokémon are in the mid-40s, which is around the same level as the Elite Four. And spoilers, this goes for most of the other gems as well. My team, on the other hand, is ranging from the 40s to 50s. I fought him with a Water-type and was completely fine. I didn't even get hit once, so I hope that illustrates my point. One gym badge down, eight to go. Heading north to Route 6, I believe it's time to finally catch a new Pokémon. Alright, Snubble. Not the best, not even a Fairy-type in this game, but it's better than nothing, and oh dear. Okay, I think it's finally time to discuss my biggest issue with Kanto. It's too fucking weak. I think you've noticed it by now, but it seems to just be a trend for everything in Pokémon Crystal to be weird with levels. The wild Pokémon are all 40 to 50 levels below what you have, so what is even the point of catching them? Yeah, you can train them up, and maybe by the time you do, Game Freak will have remade Kanto again. But why? Assuming you're playing the game normally, you should have a full team at this point, so I guess it wouldn't really matter what the levels of the wild Pokémon are. But come on, at least make them a higher level at the very least. They put the Dark-type Pokémon in here. Like, why? And the trainers? Yeah, everyone's teams here are in the mid-30s, which is just pitiful. Though, in their defense, trainers do still give off quite a bit of experience. If you go out of your way to fight them, you will gain levels, so at least there's that. Still though, the level gap between my Pokémon and theirs just makes battles even more mindless than usual. You'd think with the gym leaders, with them being around the same level as the Elite Four, they'd put up more of a fight. And a few do, I won't deny it. But that's more because I didn't have a type to combat them, not because they were actually tough. 
It's designed to where you can feasibly tackle the gym leaders in whatever order you want, which is an interesting concept. But their levels do not scale with you, so every gym leader is around the same level. It's disappointing. Moving on to Route 6, I met this guy who says the road is closed until a power plant's issue gets resolved. The game nudges you towards heading to the power plant without directly forcing you. It's like a side quest or something, I like it. Though you will need to head to the power plant before you can fully explore the region. So let's head there. I cut through Saffron City and stop by the Magnet train station. This is a new building that wasn't in Gen 1. Spoiling this right now, I never figured out how to board the Magnet train. Doesn't really matter though, it just takes you to Goldenrod and Johto. Traveling between Johto and Kanto is really cumbersome and one of my least favorite parts of the postgame. You can't just fly between regions for some reason. You have to either take the ferry again or figure out how they used a magnet train, which I cannot. Luckily, you won't have to visit Johto too often anymore, but it is still an annoyance. North of Saffron is Cerulean. I make a brief detour to Route 24. You fight through five or so opponents just like the first game, but there's not much interest here at the moment. I head back and reach the end of Route 9. The power plant always felt to me like a secret dungeon you'd find in other games. I wish Pokemon did this more often, just hiding secret places around the region for the player to discover. It makes the adventure feel more special, like you're actually exploring a region or something. Anyway, someone tampered with the power plant's generator and stole a machine part. They were last spotted in Cerulean, so that's where we go to next. There's also a scientist willing to trade me a Magneton for a Dugtrio. Interesting. We find the shady individual in the Cerulean gym, who turns out to be a rocket grunt. He is also a foreigner, I think? He speaks in broken English, and that's honestly kind of endearing. One quick battle later, he learns that Team Rocket already disbanded. Technically, they were already disbanded in Gen 1, but now they're like, super disbanded. So he tells us where the machine part is and moves to Unova. Head back to the power plant and give the part to the manager. It won't be immediately clear what this does at first, but we'll get to that soon enough. Now that that's over with, we can continue on with our adventure. I head over to the nearby rock tunnel and... Oh boy, I love this mechanic! I dragged Magnus's corpse out of the box to use Flash, and I navigated through the tunnel. This takes us back to the home of the creepypastas. One detail that I really love about the post-game is the music. The soundtrack completely shifts when you enter the Kanto region, using tracks more reminiscent of Gen 1. You'd think with this game being on the same system as Red and Blue, Game Freak would just reuse the same music from those games, but no. Nearly every track from Gen 1 has been remixed and changed up. Lavender Town, for example, was explicitly unsettling and creepy in Gen 1, but here it's much more relaxed and calm. It's like the spirits of the town have been properly laid to rest. It's one way the game illustrates how much Kanto has changed in three years. Speaking of spirits, they fucking nuked Pokemon Tower, and it has been remodeled as a radio tower. The graves were moved to Mr. Fuji's house, but still dick move, guys. When you stop by the radio tower and talk to this guy after fixing the power plant, he gives an expansion card. This upgrades the radio on the Poke Flute, opening up new channels. One of those channels is the Poke Flute. Head back to Vermilion and head left. Now, with the Poke Flute channel enabled, Snorlax will wake up and trigger a fight. Hey look guys, a Pokemon that's level 50. That's the first one I've seen in this entire damn region. I've been down a party member since the Elite Four, and I've been saving a spot just for Snorlax. He comes equipped with the leftovers too, which is quite enticing. However, uh, something happened. I, uh, underestimated my opponent. I should be more upset, but honestly, Los Angeles never did a damn thing on my team, so uh, eh. I didn't anticipate catching anything after this guy, so I went ahead and used my Master Ball. Welcome to the team, asshole. I named the Snorlax Boudreaux, a name that will hold literally no meaning to anyone except me and six other people. Inside jokes are hilarious. Snorlax also opens the way up to Diglett Cave, and oh so coincidentally, I now have an open space on my team. I caught a Diglett here for the purposes of trading. I want to see that Magneton, alright? I head through the cave and it takes us to Route 2, and here I discovered the funniest thing ever. So I guess Pokemon Crystal was pushing the Game Boy's limits or something, because there are a few areas in Kanto that don't make a return. One of those areas is the Safari Zone, it's just closed in this game, but another area is the entirety of Viridian Forest. Fucking look at this, it's been reduced to a corn maze. <laughs> this is hilarious. Also trade died. To a Beedrill as well, I suppose Jim got the last laugh. 
Heading south takes us to Viridian City. This place has a new gym leader, though like the last one, he's barely ever at the gym. Also, I think it's made of Legos. Continuing down, Pallet Town is as empty as ever, but we can enter this house, which is owned by... Red. Who's this red guy? I think he stole my house. What an asshole. I'm gonna kill him. We can talk with Professor Oak here, and he basically says, Hey, go get gym badges. Also, finish my dictionary, please. We're still not at rock bottom, so I head towards Cinnabar Island. And I gotta say, I love what they've done with the place. Yeah, it turns out the volcano on Cinnabar erupted and completely destroyed the town. That's pretty grim, I gotta say. Also, where was the volcano? You learn this information from Pokemon rival Yu, or a uh, Blue as he's known here. I liked it better when it was Yu. After talking with him, he leaves and you can fight him back at Viridian. I think I'll save him for last though. Let's move right to the Seafoam Islands. I didn't explore this place in my original Red playthrough, and in this playthrough, I still won't, but there is a new cave here. Oh, this is the gym. Blaine's been homeless for two years and has relocated to this cave. That's sad. Unfortunately for him, I do not care, so we fight. I would like to remind you that this time that I picked Totodile as my starter. So, uh, you know. After stealing an old man's wallet, I continued sailing right until I hit Fuchsia City. If you remember, Koga was the gym leader for Fuchsia, but in Gen 2, he's promoted to an Elite Four member. Thus, the new gym leader for Fuchsia is Janine, Koga's daughter. She fights with poison types as well. I used Boudreaux for this fight, and he handled it pretty well. Snorlaxes are built for tanking, after all. I don't really have an idea of where to go at this point, so I just went on Cycling Road. It's the same as ever, woo. The same can be said for Celadon City. They even kept the Rocket Game Corner and just rebranded to the Celadon Game Corner. I feel... this is illegal somehow. If you're curious, the minigames are shared with the Game Corner and Goldenrod. Celadon is also the home to another gym. I want to mention this guy has been standing outside this gym for three whole years. Dude, get a hobby. Erica wasn't really a challenge. I spammed Fly with Tubat and blacked out for two minutes. Do you see what I mean when I said mindless earlier? I somewhat get the trainers, but when even your boss fights can be beaten through button mashing, I think your game needs some rebalancing. I head left and loop back around to Saffron. I've explored nearly all the major towns, so it's time to take on the Psychic Gym. I haven't mentioned this yet, but most of the Pokemon Gyms have new layouts. Some of them have only minor differences, while others get a new layout. I bring this up because, for whatever reason, they decided not to change Saffron's gimmick, the teleporting room puzzle, one of the worst gimmicks out of all of them. Thanks, Game Freak. After a bit, though, you'll make it to Sabrina. Sabrina in the original was intimidating due to her affinity with psychic types. But now that Gem 2 has been rebalanced, she isn't too bad. Too bad didn't nearly die, however, so that was fun. I wish I could comment more on this fight, but there isn't much to say. See ya, Sabrina. Misty is up next on my list, but she won't appear in our gym at first. You have to find her on Route 24, presumably on a date, I think? Good for you, give me a badge. Since I lost my primary electric type, Misty did put up some resistance, and by that I mean it took slightly longer to button mash with Crunkle. Good work, Misty. There is one town I neglected in my travels. The home of the first gym, actually, Pewter City. There's not much to say about it, I honestly can't tell you what's different between this version and the original. Brock is the gym leader of Pewter, and he also put on a shirt finally, good for him. Brock specializes in rock Pokemon, and I'd like to remind you once again that I picked Totodile as my starter. Two minutes later, oh look, free badge! And now, we have come to this. I hope I have made it clear by now that the gym leaders in Kanto are… kinda pathetic. Not a single one could put up a decent challenge. That is, except for one. The final gym leader of the Kanto region, Blue. His gym is just you and him, just like Jasmine's gym in Johto. If you remember, that gym did not end the best for me. Will this fight be the same? Let's find out. He leads off with a Pidgeot. Unlike other gym leaders, Blue doesn't specialize in a single type. His team is very close to what he had at the end of Pokemon Red and Blue. And notably, he actually leveled up his damn team, unlike everyone else. That's why I saved him for last. Aurora dealt with the Pidgeot and then his Rhydon. Gyarados was a bit intimidating since he has Hyper Beam. Well, shit. Gyarados set up a rain dance in the previous turn, so I brought out Crunkle. He whittles down the Gyarados, but then Blue brought out Executor. The best I could do was chip away at it, but then it pulled out Sunny Day. I didn't really get why, but then I realized 
It has solar beam. Boudreaux's built like a tank, so he was my best option. And yeah, he did win, but also got real close to death in the process. Next up is Alakazam. I made the mistake of getting locked into rollout, and... well... You know, looking back at this, I'm beginning to think some of these deaths are my fault. Too bad uses Bite, and Alakazam goes down. Blue only has one Pokémon left, Arcanine. It should have been smooth sailing from there, but how about a critical hit flamethrower instead? I tried to fight it, but Too bad was just too frail. There wasn't much I could do. And then there was one, Serpent. Somehow the last member standing. As I stared down the Arcanine and my severely underleveled Furret, I came to a realization. I could not win. I had played too recklessly, too carelessly, and got my team killed. Even if there were a scenario where I got through this, I wouldn't be able to beat the game with just a Furret. I would only be delaying the inevitable. And while I was pondering this, Arcanine got another goddamn critical hit, okay sure. So, that's it then. Congratulations, Blue, you finally won. After everything I've been through, after facing the odds, this is where my journey ends. So now that the Nuzlocke's over, it's time for round two, baby! Yeah, I'm ending the Nuzlocke here. I could theoretically continue with Pokémon I still have in my box, but uh, no, I'm not doing any more level grinding. So you know what? Fuck it, I'm coming in with a level 100 Serpent. I do not care anymore. Judgment Day has come, my friend. Are you ready? Because this but Oh damn, Furt is terrible. Okay, I think this is reasonable. With all 16 gym badges in hand, Professor Oak gives us clearance for Mount Silver, the final area of the game. We could theoretically just head there immediately, but I do have a few more things to show off first. To begin, I backtrack to Mount Moon. Here is where you can encounter Shadow the Hedgehog. He seems to be in a pretty good mood and challenges us to a fight. Shadow has finally evolved some of his team members, but he shouldn't be that tough. To illustrate my point, Crunkle didn't take a single hit. Get fucked, mate. Shadow says he's gonna do more training and leaves. He's also treating his Pokémon better. Good for him. Mount Moon seems to have a new layout, by the way. I'd love to tell you more, but unfortunately, I don't care. After this event, you can rematch him every Monday and Wednesday at the Indigo Plateau. He finally evolves Golbat into Crobat, and his battle theme is replaced with a champion theme, weirdly. How hard is he? Well, he almost took out one of my Pokémon, so... Shadow is doing better than most of Kanto, I think. After beating him, Shadow will leave. If you're curious, you can refight the Elite Four as well, but they don't have any stronger teams. This is the last you'll see of your rival. Honestly, I'm a bit underwhelmed. He barely has a presence in the post-game, and he doesn't get much more development. His final appearance is tied to a daily event, that's pretty lame. I stand by what I said before, I do think he's the best rival in the series. But his post-game's appearances aren't doing him much favors. With the rival done, let's go meet up with Kurt finally. He should be done with that Pokeball I asked him to make... 8 months ago. There is actually another reason why we're here though. I already cheated earlier to get my level 100 Serpent, so I might as well go all in and get the GS Ball. The GS Ball is an unobtainable item you were meant to get through an event. It's amazing how Game Freak has been doing these limited time events since Pokémon's very inception. I think with Gen 1, there was only one event, which gave you Mew. I don't think it ever happened outside Japan, though. Thanks, guys. For Generation 2, we have this event, once again Japan only. You would receive the GS Ball inside a Poké Center and take it back to Kurt. After a day passes, Kurt will say the ball was shaking and that Ilex Forest has become restless. I really like how if you go into the forest, the trees will actually animate. It's a really cool detail for an event that literally no one experienced. You'll spot the shrine once again. Initially, interacting with the shrine wouldn't do anything. Interact with it now, however, and it will ask if you want to place the GS Ball inside it. Do so, and then this happens. Celebi is the mythical Pokémon of Generation 2. It will be level 30 when encountered, and I also caught it with the first Ultra Ball I threw. Neat. I really wish events like these were just playable in the game normally. I think this event in particular was added to the 3DS version of these games, and that's pretty cool. I wish Pokémon would do that more often. 
Gen 4 might be the worst offender here, with some pretty neat stuff locked behind events you can't access anymore. Without cheating, of course. That may also be why, in later games, they would just give you mythical Pokémon without any fanfare or story. Or it's laziness, I don't know. On the topic of legendaries, let's go see Suicune in Cyanwood. It leaves as soon as I approach, and then Yuzine pops up, talking about how much he loves Suicune or something. I can think of worse legendaries to simp over. If you fly over to Ekertik now, you will have access to the Tin Tower. This is where the Burnt Tower and the Legendary Beast stories are revealed. In the tower itself, you will see the three Legendary Beasts again, though only Suicune will stick around to battle you. Suicune is significantly harder to catch than Celebi, so I did a funny thing and killed it instead. Don't do that, by the way. According to a comment I received on my Pokemon Crystal video, I'm pretty sure I've locked myself out of Ho-Oh, since you need all three of the Legendary Dogs for him to appear. Assuming Suicune doesn't respawn, I have just screwed myself over. Thanks, game. Well, if ho is not coming down, then I'll go for the other guy instead. To start this quest, talk to this old man in Pewter City who will hand you the Silver Wing. Now fly to Cyanwood in Johto and sail right. The Whirl Islands are a series of interconnected caves that loop around. There's only one entrance we care about, and it will take us to the bottom. This is where the legendary Pokémon awaits, Lugia. I haven't stated what I think about ho or Lugia yet. They're good Pokémon, I like their designs. ho has great lore, and the story surrounding Lugia's creation is interesting as well. I love how the game doesn't force these Pokémon on you, they're just out in the wild for you to discover, and that's rare for a box art legendary. They're not my favorite, but they have a place in my heart. See ya, Lugia. I think I've done everything I want to do now, so let's not waste any more time. Let's go to Mount Silver. Route 28 and the Silver Cave have a Poké Center and a single house. The house is blocked by trees, however, so I guess we'll never know what's inside. The Pokémon's levels here are around the early 40s. Really? Is that really the best you could offer me? I am going up against the final boss, and the best you could do is a level 39 Tangela. I fucking hate this game. Also at this time, I did something that I kinda regret doing in retrospect. Spoiling this now, the only thing of interest in Mount Silver is a single trainer, who has Pokémon around level 70 and 80. I kinda assumed I needed my Pokémon to be around that level as well, and since I didn't want to grind against level 40 wild Pokémon, I cheated again just to get everyone up to level 70. However, I went back to see other people's videos, and it does seem like this fight is more than doable with Pokémon around level 50 and 60. I really wish I knew that before I, uh, leveled everyone up. I was even gonna call out this last segment of the game as a huge difficulty spike, but it really doesn't seem to be that way. So if you do end up doing this fight, eh, just keep that in mind. My final team will be Crunkle the Feraligator, Tubat the Crobat, Magnus the Magneton, Los Angeles the Useless, Boudreaux the Snorlax, and Aurora the Dragonite. Without further ado, let's finish this. Mount Silver is a very straightforward cave. Most diverging paths will lead you to items you probably don't need at this point. Just keep going north, and you'll find this entrance. At the end, you'll find a narrow path, with a trainer at the very end. Let's talk to them. Pokémon Trainer Red wants to battle. I finally found you. Now give me back my damn house. Red leads off with a level 81 Pikachu, his highest level Pokémon. As intimidating as that sounds, it's a Pikachu. You should honestly be fine if you have any ground-type move. Red sends out Venusaur next, and begins setting up a Sunny Day Solar Beam. Boudreaux could tank a few hits, so I switched to him. Venusaur falls quickly after, with Boudreaux relatively fine. After that comes Espeon, a real random Pokémon for Red to be carrying. The remakes replace it with Lapras, which I think fits better. This whole team consists of Gen 1 Pokémon, after all. My strategy here was to just use Sleep and Snore, and that seems to work out pretty well. Red takes notice of this, and brings out his own Snorlax. And as soon as he's out, he gets a critical hit Body Slam. I switched to Los Angeles, and finally took advantage of his explosion. Farewell, my friend. Your sacrifice will not be forgotten. I follow up with Aurora to finish off the Snorlax, and then he immediately used Sleep. You died for nothing, Los Angeles. And oh, look at that! He also has Snore! Gee, thank you! This Snorlax might as well be the real final boss. Fuck the Pikachu. If you can take out this guy, you've won. And I did, eventually, after taking like five minutes. Red sends out Blastoise next, who apparently had Blizzard. Probably should have seen that coming. Magnus uses Zap Cannon, which has a pretty sick animation, and Blastoise goes down. Red only has one Pokémon left, Charizard. I would like to remind you that Magnus is a Steel-type. I bring out Tubat to just chip away at it. They do a damn good job, but ultimately die to Flamethrower. I think it's only fair for Krunkle to finish this, even if he didn't do much else in this fight. The Surf hits, 
And that's it. So there we have it, the end of the Game Boy Pokemon games. Well, sort of, there are a few spin-off games kicking around, but focusing on the mainline series, this was the last one before the jump to the Game Boy Advance. But before we get into that, I need to answer the question I asked at the beginning. Is Pokemon Crystal's post-game actually good? I have no idea! Now, no matter what, I do think Pokemon Crystal, when considering its main campaign, is great as it stands. It's a step up from the first generation, introduces a lot of great mechanics and quality of life features, and is still fun to play through. But my playthrough of Kanto in this was, honestly, not that interesting. There's not much plot, there's very few new Pokemon to find and catch, and 90% of the bosses do not put up a fight. Blue was a good challenge, Red was a good challenge, uh, the legendaries were neat? Yeah, I don't know, man. A part of me almost feels like I've wasted my time. I mean, if you really enjoyed Crystal, then yeah, sure, I'd recommend playing through this. But for me, I'm honestly content with my original playthrough. I didn't get much out of the post-game, I'm sorry. Am I going to say it's overrated? Well, no. The idea of exploring another region is exciting, and as I said in the beginning, Pokemon's post-games are very scattered in quality. I'd say this is up there, at least. But I don't think it's the best. Gen 5 does a much better job, just saying that now. I guess what I'm trying to say is, just play HeartGold and SoulSilver, got it? Good, see ya.